Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Raw, your favorite rules discussion show for Goodman Games. I am your host, Matt Robertson, otherwise known as Grape Ape, joined by my wonderful co-host. Stefan Srod, otherwise known as DM Bad Rongfa. And today we have two very experienced judges with us from the Dungeon Crawlers Discord server. Now, Dungeon Crawlers, as you know, is a DCC fan Discord server. Uh, I'm going to introduce them from left to right in no order of preference. Uh, Bread Wizard, Darren, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I've been into the Goodman Games world for probably since the pandemic, since 2020. That's when I picked up the rule book and realized, yeah, this is exactly what I was looking for. And then I found MCC and I said, yeah, this is exactly what I was looking for. And now I found Umerica and I'm like, oh, you know what? This is exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> so, and uh, diving in full on and running as many games as I can. And we also have with us tonight Brew and Drood, otherwise known as Jake. Jake, how are you doing this evening? I'm good. Thank you, too, for having me on. Um, I got into DCC uh, last year, right around March, when Goodman Games came out with their Crypt of the Devil Lich campaign, and they were doing the 5e and the DCC conversions. I backed it for the 5e, but then shortly after the campaign, I saw on their website the uh, first time fan kit, and that was it. As soon as I got the rule book, I read it cover to cover and worked worked my way into getting to my first DCC game in October of 2021. And then uh, in January 2022, I just went head first and started running DCC games. And I have played in games by both of these gentlemen, and they are no strangers to the rules or adapting the rules. So they're going to be great guests on the show. Um, first, we're going to hit them with our questions from last week, uh, last episode, Stefan. So is starting luck the maximum value it can ever have? And uh, my answer was no. Stefan, do you recall what you said on that topic? I believe I said no, too. Uh, we said it can increase, decrease. Uh, Darren, what do you think about that one? I'm in agreement. I think that it's 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 used as like a reward mechanic, so it shouldn't have a maximum, at least within reason. I mean, most players are going to be spending that as much as they can, and uh, especially if they can get more and they know they can get more, they'll be more willing to spend it. All right, and Jake, what do you think? Um, I'm going to say no as well, because I personally have played in games where at the end of the adventure, luck was rewarded for overcoming whatever challenges there were. And as you all said previously, you know, your characters are going to be burning luck. So it's always going to be kind of in a state of flux. If you had a case where a character didn't spend any luck, let's say they started with 12 and the end of the adventure came and everybody earned two points would you let them go up to 14 or are they capped at 12 right there i'd let them go up yeah it for me it depends on the ruling because i do tend to make that distinction in my game i will tell them the players that they either gain two points of permanent luck or they restore two points of lost luck that's a good point permanent versus temporary all right our next question from last episode is can you use luck to lower a spell check stefan what did you determine on that I said yes, but I, I did admit I was kind of on flimsy grounds there. I think you convinced me. I think I said yes, too, but it was also kind of iffy. Uh, Jake, what do you think about that? Um, coming off the top of my head, rules is written. I don't think that it is possible to burn luck to lower the check of a spell result. That sounds like a a judge call, because I know there are spells within... DCC that are that say specifically with a higher result you can choose lower and um, trying not to diverge from the main DCC a little bit too much there is an instant in the new dying earth where I think magicians can burn luck to get lower spell results so I'm gonna and, say and now no. you remind me of that I think I said no too I don't think Stefan did convince me I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch that Darren what's your opinion on that one? I definitely fall in the, the no camp. Uh, luck is a additive bonus that increases results. 
I don't think it should be used to reduce results. All right. And our third question of that episode is, can halflings give luck if they are bleeding out? I, I remember my answer to this one was emphatically no. They're unconscious. They can't even see you. Stefan, I think you said yes, right? I said yes. My, my end result was yes, but it has to be like within, before it hits their initiative or, or before it hits the, the time right. in the next round where they were reduced to zero hit points, you know, because we're, we're still in that simultaneous action quantum state until then that's when their body hits the floor I, I agree with you on that one darren what do you think yeah i i agree with that too i i also think this is where the the way that the rules act as a simulation of a battle situation sorts sort of sort of starts to break down because like Stefan said, it's it's this weird sort of quantum state where everything is happening at once, but we're playing it out in sequence because it's too chaotic to all talk at once and do things like that. So I think it has to be situational. It has to be judge's discretion. But generally, they can't because they're bleeding out. They're technically dead until someone rolls the body. Can you imagine that if the judge said, all right, everybody tell me your action exactly at the same time and throw the dice? <laughs> uh, Jake, what's your opinion on that question? Um, I'm going to say no. I'm going to agree with you, uh, Great Babe, there, because even in kind of that whole sort of chaos of battle, um, even at zero HP, I feel like the halfling would just wouldn't have the focus, even if they were still conscious or awake, as it were, you know, whether it was a blow to the head, something in the chest, you're kind of, you're bleeding out, you're, you're trying to dodge the wound or uh, doing stuff like that. You know, I've bumped my head pretty hard a few times, and I'm not really focusing on anything else other than trying to stay conscious. That is a good point. All right. So our last question for episode five was, should characters gain luck after each adventure? Uh, Jake, we're going to let you take this one first. Okay. After each adventure, no. Um, especially, you know, with some homebrew stuff, a lot of the, a lot of the adventures that it, people are going to go on are going to be basic, basic. You know, the townsfolk need help doing something, clearing out the cave because there's a hungry bear coming in, or there's a spider infestation, and you know that's just run of the mill mercenary adventure stuff. But in adventures where they're kind of dealing with demigods or more powerful beings and actually like, you know, doing things that can upset and change the whole world as it is, then I would say that those types of adventures would be good to have luck as a reward. All right. And Darren, what are your thoughts? So I'd say, yeah, after every adventure. And for my uh, justification, I would look at the table 7-9 on page 361, because even though it does give examples of big things that affect the balance between law and chaos, there's also a range of the modifiers, plus one to plus three. So I think there can easily be mundane things you do that still help, that still are helping the, the balance, and you get a plus one for that. For big stuff, maybe you'll get a plus two or a plus three. But I also am notoriously bad at remembering to give people bonus luck, so I think uh, I should fix that. As we all are, except for Stefan. Stefan's usually on it in his games. He gives out he gives out good luck. I try. But yeah, maybe some mundane adventures can still be in, in favor of the balance. You know, maybe you're house-sitting for a unicorn. Uh, you're helping a unicorn, so it counts. Yeah. That's yeah, true. Yeah, but I bet there's exciting things that happen at a unicorn's house. <laughs> I, I bet you there are. Well, our first question for episode six, this episode, it's kind of warrior centric. Elena, if you could bring up question one for us Does a warrior advancing from zero level to first level have to choose a lucky weapon? If they don't have a luck modifier, meaning their luck modifier is zero, or if they have a negative luck modifier. Are they forced to pick that unlucky weapon that's going to give them a reduction to hit? Uh, Darren, what are your thoughts on that? So my initial reading is that the the way the warrior chapter describes this, it does say that the kind of weapon must be chosen at first level. What it doesn't say is whether they have to use it. 
and I think this would be a great RP opportunity because you could have a bad luck score and then your lucky weapon is this longsword and you hate using the longsword. Your dad always made you use a longsword and you're terrible at it. You want to use the axe. That's what you're better at. That's what you feel more comfortable using. So you're not going to get your lucky bonus, but you're not going to get that penalty either. I like that. And, you know, every monster they face or something could have a longsword, so they never get to pick up anything else. They're always finding longswords, and they're like, damn it, I don't want another longsword. Um, uh, Rejigger re- that longsword into a pole arm with the right guy, you know, find the right blacksmith. Oh, yeah. Jake, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm going to agree with Darren on this and say that the rod does seem to point to warriors having to select a weapon, but also, as he says, there's no rule that says the warrior has to use that weapon. So yeah, if you have a minus one, you can just pick a throwaway weapon. Like, you know, what the heck is a warrior going to do with a garret? That's true. When they have access to things like two-handed swords and battle well, axes. The, the garret might not even be in their list of true weapons. I don't know. I'd have to look. Ste- Stefan, what do you think? I'm, I'm with them. Got the same kind of answer. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd pick darts and ask my judge every time we're in a tavern uh have just like make something terrible happen to me i'm always like hitting people in the head with darts getting in trouble um and and if you really want something you know that can be a fun you know reward in a homebrew campaign of you know rewarding by reversing your luck in the context of just your lucky weapon um right. and Exactly. You got a quest for it. I, I agree that they must choose a unlucky weapon if they have his or or no luck weapon if they have no modifier or a negative modifier. Lane, if you could bring out handout one A for us. Uh this is the rule we're referring to. And on page forty two, under the warrior description for luck, it says at first level, a warrior's luck modifier applies to attack rolls with one specific kind of weapon. That this kind of weapon must be chosen at first level, and the modifier is fixed at its starting value. Neither the weapon nor the modifier changes over the course of a warrior's career. So yeah, that would be pretty definitive it says must choose so whether there's no modifier or negative modifier they have to pick one so kind of like pick a throwaway or rp uh rp weapon but if we look at the other classes elena if you can bring out handout 1b let's talk about the other kind of luck categories for other characters on page 31 it says a cleric a cleric's luck modifier applies to all spell checks turn unholy. 49, it says a wizard. A wizard's luck modifier applies to rolls for corruption and material magic. So they don't have choices either. But then we get to that elf. That elf that people think is kind of overpowered and gets away with so much with only having that iron deficiency ability. On page 57 for the elf, it says, with their long lifespan, elves have ample opportunity to practice their magic craft. At first level, an elf may choose to apply their luck modifier to spell checks on one spell of their choosing. This modifier does not change as the elf's luck score changed. So we really can't tell this to Paul, uh, one of the guys we got in the dungeon crawler service, because that's just going to give him another reason to hate elves. But I think that might be where the confusion comes from, because elves get to pick their lucky spell if they want to. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts about that? Well, I think in both instances, the language is very clear, and they're re- referring to specific things. So I feel like trying to conflate that with the warrior is just straight up not accurate to what the, what the book says. Jacob, what do you think? Yeah, I'm there. I mean, especially with that flavor text of having the time to practice their spells. If they're, you know, if they're unlucky, then, and they're practicing their magic, then they're going to be smart enough to realize that they're not very lucky. I don't quite know how, how to RP luck like that. But, you know, if they know that their, that that luck modifier is going to affect their, spell casting negatively why would they add it to it 
Well, I, to argue that, I don't know that they would know coming from zero level to first level. We got to remember that this is an experienced uh, adventurer here. This is just a villager. Uh, so in that case, would even a zero to first level warrior know if they're unlucky with a certain weapon? Or you Depends know how much they've uh, been using that weapon in in their zero level life. You well, know the the woodsman's gonna know he's like trash with the axe, or but you're choosing as a player, so you're not gonna probably choose the axe. You're gonna choose darts or something like that. I think with the uh, with the elf with their choice, I think that is sort of where the the flavor text that Jake mentioned, the using their long lifespan to practice their craft, that's when they would be able to make that informed decision. You know what? I don't have good luck with this spell. I should not choose to do it. Well, and to kind of something happened. So I dug deep on this one. And Elaine, if you could bring out handout 1C, this is from the beta rules. Uh, this is the elf description from page 43 of the beta rules. With their long lifespan, elves have ample opportunity to practice their magic craft. An elf's luck modifier applies to spell checks on one first level spell chosen at character creation. So elves didn't always get off scot-free with that unlucky spell. In the beta rules, they did have to choose an unlucky spell. But if we bring out handout 1D, which is the first edition rule, Page 57 of the first edition rules, the luck for the elf got changed. It says, with their long lifespan, elves have ample opportunity to practice their magic craft. At first level, an elf's luck modifier applies to spell checks on one spell of his choosing. That modifier does not change as the elf's luck score changes. So I, I misspoke there. They still had to choose at first level, but after that, somewhere between first and fourth edition, I checked the fourth edition too. Uh, is where that changed. So even at the conception of the game, they still had to choose that unlucky spell. So what do you guys think happened there? People kept at applying it to patron bond or invoke patron and getting really bad rolls. It <laughs> does make sense. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if it was uh, sort of the same justification that we came up with, like, they're, they've got plenty of time to do trial and error, or maybe they should have the opportunity to make that informed choice. I think this is just this is just elven privilege leaking into the game. Elven privilege. Uh, the elves yeah. had a letter writing campaign, and they oh. sent them all in. <laughs> if Paul sees and this, Keeblers. So, I've got one more handout for us. Handout 1E. And these are my little excerpts from the forums. If we bring up handout 1E, uh, we've got B. Holmes 4 saying, you know, this works well for me, talking about some other rule. I just don't like the negative modifier as it encourages players to actually put that weapon away. It's silly. Uh, so these are kind of people, you know, discussing that they don't like having a negative modifier. Uh, Z Dan Man says, I have a simple solution for lucky weapon. The bonus for lucky weapon is fixed in my campaign, but this can never be a negative. Never. Uh, this is a class feature and ability, not a disadvantage. So there, there was a lot of pushback on the warrior's unlucky weapon, but it stayed in the rules. And then finally, Reverend Dak responded uh, later in 2012 to that same message from Z D Man. And he had an excellent point, kind of like you did, Darren. He says, I'm a fan of the permanent feature of luck, bad or good. I see nothing wrong with it. It adds flavor. It's really about avoiding this whole superhero aspect of modern gaming. Uh, you know, and he talks about how you can role play that into your character. Uh, so I thought that was spot on. So let's take our final votes on the matter. Does a warrior advancing from zero level to first level have to choose a lucky weapon, even if they don't have a luck modifier or have a negative modifier? Stefan, why don't you go first? They got to just deal with it. And if they don't want to deal with it, they can quest for it. I agree. It's directly in the rules. It says they must choose a weapon regardless of the modifier, and it stays that way. So yes, they do have to change choose a weapon. Jake, what is your final answer on the topic? Final answer is yes. And they Darren? 
Final answer is also yes, they must choose. Four yeses. There you have it, folks. Rules as written. Our next question, Elaine, if you could bring up question two, is can you add luck to a deed die roll to make a mighty deed of arms successful? Stefan, do you got opinions on this one? Oh, yeah. Uh, you cannot do that. It is the deed die roll, not the deed die result. Um, just with those high level warriors who have, you know, at ninth and tenth level when you're getting to roll like a D whatever and it but you also get a plus two. That plus two doesn't just make everything a successful deed. The actual die has to come up a three or higher. Jake, I see you shaking your head. Does that mean you're in agreement? Yeah, I'm definitely in agreement. Um and if you point to the raw, I don't remember. I think it actually says it throughout anywhere a deed is meant. It says, if your deed die comes up, a three or higher. So it's mentioning the die itself, not the roll that you have on the deed die. And then You might have a handout to, to back yeah. that up. <laughs> and then going back to the raw, it says luck can only affect rolls. And Darren, so with the deed you... die, it's the face, not the roll. All right. And Darren, what do you think? So nominally, I am in agreement. However, I also think that it's situational. Uh, if we look at the the bullet points on page 19 that talk about burning luck, uh, one of them says that characters can burn luck to survive life or death situations. And then they can burn luck to give a one-time bonus to a roll. If the deed were something that was going to be getting them out of a life or death situation, I would allow a luck burn on that, on that roll. Uh, I'd especially allow it if the deed was going to save another companion. But if it was just using the deed to get a little bit of an edge in battle, I don't think that's a life or death situation. Well, I tend to agree with you guys, but as I researched it, my opinion kind of wavered a little bit. Let me see if I can convince you otherwise. Elaine, if we can bring up handout 2A. Um, first, we have to reference the critical hit roll. Uh for my argument, because on page 79, it says a natural roll of 20 is a critical hit. On page 81, it again says on a D20 roll, a natural roll of 20 is a critical hit. Uh, natural 20 automatically hits the attacker, must roll his crit die on the appropriate crit hit table with the result adjusted by his luck modifier. So on those two cases, it specifically references natural roll. In the deed die, Mighty Deeds of Arms, it does not say a natural roll. If we can bring up handout 2B on page 42 under the warrior description, it says if the deed die is a three or higher, doesn't say a natural three. The attack lands, the total attack has to exceed the target's armor class, the deed succeeds. If the deed die is a two or less, or the overall attack fails, the deed fails as well. So it is referencing the deed die. I, I acquiesce that. Uh, but it doesn't specify natural. If we look at handout 2C under the Mighty Deeds of Arms, it says a warrior can declare a Mighty Deed of Arms, or deed for short, prior to any attack. Mm -hmm. And Stefan, we need to talk to Bob about that because I, I, I've changed back my opinion that it can go after any attack. <laughs> If his D die comes up as a three or better and the attack lands, example, the total attack roll exceeds the target armor class, the deed succeeds. So, Jake, I think this was the rule that you referenced. If his D die comes up as a three or better, so we would have to define comes up. Does comes up mean raised with luck, or does comes up mean the die face on there? Comes up doesn't say natural three, as is specified with the crits. So what do you think about that, Jay? Um, there again, I'm still going to say that it kind of depends on the face because, you know, again, looking at the raw, luck affects a, a text, or, excuse me, affects die rolls. And it never, it calls it, you know, you have to roll the dice for your deed, but it doesn't actually call that a die roll. It's if the uh, <clears throat> deed land, or is a three or higher. So I'm right. still still standing firm on it has to be a three. So if you're rolling to hit my monster and you roll a 12 
and you have a plus one strength bonus or whatnot, uh, you throw two points on there for your deed die. What is your roll to hit my monster? Fifteen. Fifteen. That's the total. And that's where the question comes in my mind. Because if it doesn't say natural, it's not specifying that it actually has to be the result on the die, in my opinion. Darren, what do you think? I would agree with that. Um, also, looking back at the warrior section, I mean, it, it doesn't say if the D-die comes up as a three or higher. It says that the D-die is a three or higher. So, to me, that leaves it open for using your luck to bump it up to a three. In with the caveat that it's in that sort of life or death situation that I that I mentioned before, and it changes the result of the dice roll. It it, it modifies what the dice roll finale number is. Stefan, have we convinced you yet? No, you haven't. Um, no, you can add luck to your attack roll, to your damage roll, but not your D die roll. The D die is gonna stay the D die. Because so also, what, if what you makes could, the you're like. Different? Because we are talking in the the handout, the D die comes up. We don't say if the spell check comes up, uh, twenty, you know, then the fireball is super good. Um, the D die is also special because it is boosting two separate rolls. It is boosting your attack and it's boosting your damage. There's no other roll like it in the game that is uh, affecting. You know, the D die is almost like a a secondary or a supporting role to, uh, it you know, it's secondary in that way that your attack and your damage are the primary roles that it's affecting. So it has a it does like just mechanically also have a very different function than other you know subsystems. Elena, let's bring up handout two D real quick. Uh, further into page eighty eight in discussion of the mighty deeds of arms says the deed succeeds at the most basic level if the attack hits and the deed die is a three or higher. The attack inflicts normal damage and the deed takes place. Now, it doesn't say the deed die result, meaning a combined combination of whatever bonuses you put on there, and it doesn't also say a natural three or higher. Why would it be specified for crits? Because I, I think JG wants to drive that point home that it has to be a natural 20 on the dice for it to be a crit. But that same specification wasn't used for the natural result of the D die. And if we're talking about luck, you can add luck to any dice roll to change yeah. the result of it. It just says a you can add luck to a roll. It doesn't specify the types of rolls. A die is being rolled. That's what I say. I, I think it's more of just a thing coming out of it's a big book. It's there's a lot of editing to do. Yep. As we've noted on this show before, sometimes there's been errors as there's been revisions through printing, you know, uh print runs. That's obvious. And it's it's not a, a hidden fact either. Um Matt, if I if I may jump the gun slightly, I think we also have a very much supporting no, Back not yet. Here. Don't bring that oh, up yet. No, no. Up almost, almost. Uh, so thank you for reminding me, though, Stefan. We are using the eighth printing of the DCC RPG uh, PDF volume. Uh, so if you want to reference the pages, that's where you can find it. Jake, have we swayed your opinion at all? No. No. Because, I mean, you have to roll a deed dice, but they do not call it a dice roll in the book. It says if the deed is a three or higher, if it comes up a three or higher, not if you roll a three or higher. Well, so I, I waver on this one because as a judge, I like to, you know, reward the use of luck. They, You want them to use the luck. Um, so Sleepy Fingers had a question. I missed it. What about the wording in the rules that said the deed die is? How is that to be interpreted? Uh, no, that, that wasn't, that was, that was uh, our lovely yeah, you know behind the scenes lady Vitani Maru aka Elena she was adding both you and me in the Twitch chat yeah that's it. similar to what I was talking about in the on page um I just lost it but the it says that if the D die is that would be page 88 uh, if the attack hits and the D die is a three or higher if 
it, just like we said, if the attack is a 12, you get a plus one strength bonus, add two on it. Your attack roll is 15. If I roll a two on the D die and use one l luck point, my D die is a three. Yep. If we follow the mechanics of all the other rules in the game. Yep, the same language is in the warrior section the first time the deeds are mentioned. All right, now you can bring out the big gun, Stefan. Now that all right. now, now that I've convinced Darren completely. Uh, You're just the devil's advocate here. The devil himself. But uh, if you bring up until I found that Stephen, handout. I'm still on your side here. If we bring out handout 2F, we have a post by Joseph Goodman on the forums back April 28th, 2012. And he's saying in there, you know, starts off with, I guess I should have made it more clear. Um, <laughs> as Harley and Steven noted, I'm not, I know who Harley is. I'm not sure. If, probably means Steven Newton. It's most likely culprit. Um, but the D die determined success of a pure result of plus three with no modifiers, kind of like a natural one for a fumble or a natural 20 for a crit. So they didn't, he didn't use the word natural in that specific section, but that is the intended meat. And, and this is kind of what drove the nail in the coffin for me. I found this little clip from JG saying, this is the way I intended it. Uh, it's not written that way, but it has to be a natural result on the dice. So uh, ultimately, my final answer to this question is, can you add luck to a deed die roll to make a mighty deed of arms successful? No, you cannot. Uh, Stefan, what is your final answer? It is still no. Uh, Jake? Not possible. And Darren, I I was with you. I was I was supporting that line of thought, but after that clip from JG, I, I had to jump the fence. W what's your final answer? I'll stick to my guns until the next printing corrects that omission. <laughs> All right. Yep. So kind of another a cover to add to my shelf. Going off of that stuff, and can you add luck to the D die roll and not make the mighty deeds of arm successful, but bonus to boost those uh to hit and damage? I would say no because that's just too good. I will. I've got nothing written to back it up. I don't think it's addressed specifically in the text. Um, I have, uh, as a player, asked for this and been told no by a, a Mr. Brendan LaSalle at a convention game. So I'm gonna go with his ruling. All right, so for that isn't an official question, but if can you add luck to a D die roll to just increase the to hit and attack? My answer is absolutely yes, because you can add luck to any dice roll. Your mighty deeds of arms still won't be successful, but you can boost that damage and to hit. Jake, what do you think about that little question? Um, I I guess if it's not to affect the deed roll, then sure. To me, it just sounds like burning luck with extra steps. And Darren? I'm generally in favor of any situation where players are burning more luck and then thus have less luck when they really need it. So that's a yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we, we me and Darren get a little kind of a little consolation prize out of that whole question, but can you use luck to add to make Mighty Deeds of Arms successful? No, you cannot. Yeah. Question three, Elena. If you could bring up question three. Can a warrior use their D die for other feats of strength like skill checks or non-attack actions, like pushing a door open or throwing a dwarf? Everybody loves to throw a dwarf. Um, I was running the Endless Chasm of Gaxum by Hector Cruz from the GFA 2018 Gone Farmer's Almanac um, last week. And spoiler alert, if you don't want to know, um, you're falling through a cavern, and Jake, you rolled nine unsuccessful luck checks, right? With a luck of 11, yes. 11 luck, Jake rolls nine unsuccessful luck checks in a row, people. I've never seen it. But they were trying to determine how to get him to stop falling, because he had gotten hit, and his dead body was falling. And the warrior wanted to throw a barrel that one of the zero levels had and try to hit his momentum over to a ledge. And so I like to say, yeah, you're a warrior. Those deeds wouldn't just come with your attacks. They would, you know, happen in all kinds of crazy 
strength-based things that you would do. So I usually let the deed go for all kinds of situations. Stefan, what are your immediate thoughts on that? Yes, you absolutely can. Uh, you know, a, a mighty deed doesn't have to be under, you know, a fatal threat. It can, we, we've all been impressed by, you know, a, a wrestling show. They're pulling off mighty deeds all the time. No one's actually going to die. Right? It doesn't matter what, you know, what the Undertaker says he's going to do. He's not going to actually kill anyone unless they get the casket out. Uh, so, yes. And, Darren, what do you think? Can you use I... a mighty deed other than for attack? So, for me, this is a hard no. At first, I was thinking, okay, you know what? Maybe life or death situations, that could fit. But every mention of a mighty deed specifically says that it's tied to attacks. They're declared before attacks. Uh, so I don't think that a deed would be the appropriate action in this case. However, there is the section in the, in, in the ability scores thing on page 19. Characters can make luck checks to attempt feats that succeed based on luck alone. So I think that would be the time to have the warrior do something crazy like that and use that mechanic rather than trying to shoehorn the mighty deed, which is a combat maneuver, into uh, a non-combat situation. That's a great point. Uh, Jake, what are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are yes, that they can add a mighty deed to a skill check, kind of declare one, because even in the introductory part of the mighty deeds in the warrior section, they talk about, where you're swinging from chandeliers and bashing down doors. You know, I mean, we love seeing warriors and fighting and action in movies and stuff like that, but we also love watching them just charge through and break down a door. It's not something that, you know, in fiction, other characters are doing. It's your tanky fighter, tough guy types. So I'm kind of torn on this one. On, on Darren's point, uh, I'm half with him that it does specify every attack in the rule book, but on Jake's point, if we bring up handout 3A, page 42, under the Mighty Deeds of Arms for Warriors description, says warriors earn their gold with pure physical prowess, they swing across chapels on chandelier chains, bash through iron-banded oaken doors, and leap over chasms in pursuit of their foes. So it does give a description of all these amazing things the warrior can do under the Mighty Deeds of Arms. Now, is that saying that they do that regardless of the Mighty Deeds of Arms? That's the part that's up to interpretation. Because when you go into the second part, it says, when locked in mortal melee, their Mighty Deeds of Arms turn the course of battle. A brazen bull rush to push back the enemy lines, a swinging flail to entangle the beastman's sword arm, or a well-placed dagger through the enemy knight's visor. So it does specify when locked in mortal melee combat. That is when their mighty deeds of arms can turn the course of a battle. Or does it just mean that, hey, they're doing mighty deeds. When locked in mortal combat, it can turn the course of a battle. You can interpret that two different ways there. So let's bring up handout 3B. This is the one that kind of locks it in. It says, prior to any attack roll, a warrior can declare a mighty deed of arms for short, or for short, a deed. This deed is a dramatic combat maneuver within the scope of the current combat. I mean, it kind of locks the definition right there. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Uh, I don't I really agree with that. And I'm also, I want to dust off my, my English degree in that bit about swinging across chapels on chandeliers and bashing through doors and leaping over chasms, all of those are in pursuit of their foes. We got the Oxford comma going on there. They're all mm -hmm. about pursuing their foes. It's not just breaking open the door because the thief lost his tools. It's all about combat. So I'm totally in agreement there. Jake? Um, well, I'm sorry. That was a good point made by Darren there. Um, that was a good point. But I mean, it does. I guess. I guess for raw, it would lock it in, and I wouldn't, and you couldn't do it. But in my games, I want to see that kind of cool stuff, so I'll always allow warriors and dwarves to add their deed die. Stefan, what do you think? Has it changed your opinion at all? 
It has not, and I have a uh, secret non-handout for you. I love secret handouts. Well, it's not a it's a secret non-handout because I I found this earlier just a couple hours ago because I was thinking I know I've seen something, um, but I was going ah I I can't, I can't like make something send it to Lilana and get her confused and I'm also just pretty busy day for me, um. But I remembered when I ran a miracle was framed, the our most spoilerific module from the title alone. But on page five of that, the miracle has this crazy tower. Like every turn, it is just changing from jagged crystal to a just a tower of fire, just fire. Um, and as long as it's not fire, it specifically says on there that you can. Use a mighty deed to throw a grappling hook on. And I'll read it verbatim. Due to the height, only a mighty deed of arms is sufficient to reach the balcony with a thrown grappling hook AC-16. And then I kept looking, and I found another instance of this in Lepkirio's Gambit, which uh, you can find in Chaos Rising. It's one of the adventures contained in there. And on page 19, there is a bridge, and one of those chasms we've already mentioned it says, uh, you know, you can do this or that. The mountainside in here, alternatively, a mighty deed of arms or a DC-20 strength check can be used to leap across a 15-foot wide chasm. I will also say, though, these are both in pursuit to of one extent or another of an enemy. In the Glipkario's Gambit instance, it's more, it's depending on how you're going, you're either kind of running away from or in pursuit of and in the Amira call was framed one that is the beginning of kind of a heist where you're trying to enter you know and begin that pursuit those are some excellent points and I love secret handouts and Elena says you can definitely send those to her um, let's let's talk about the skill checks for a way we talked about the uh, mighty deeds of arms it's pretty specific in the raw on the wording but let's see what it says during the skill checks. Elaine, if we could bring up handout 3C. It says, page 66, skill checks are modified by the appropriate ability score. This is described in more detail below. Generally speaking, a character's strength, agility, personality, or intelligence modify, a modifier apply to any skill check. So if we look at the skill checks, it says appropriate ability score. That's what modifies skill checks. Do we consider the Mighty Deed of Arms an appropriate ability? I would say no. Again, going back to the fact that it, the procedure for doing a Mighty Deed is that you have to declare it before an attack. Okay. Jake? Um, in that instance, I would say only for strength or ability or agility-based checks because you're going to be doing something with your body and you're trying to pull off something fantastic. In right. which case, you could do your deed there. I mean, the whole warrior's whole persona is that they do these mighty deeds of arms to pull off fantastic things. So why wouldn't that apply to skill checks is my personal opinion. If we bring up handout 3D on page 88 under the mighty deeds of arms category, it says a warrior can declare a mighty deed of arms or deed for short prior to any attack. Kind of like Darren saying, every time it references, it says prior to an attack. The warrior must declare his deed before his attack is taken. And our last handout for this question is handout 3E, page 89. There is no limit to the type of deeds that a warrior can perform. This is where it gets me back on the fence again. Any situation appropriate specialized attack should be encouraged. Creative players will come up with new deeds, encourage and allow this. So there again, it does, si does specify any situation appropriate, specialized attack. I think my answer is gonna have to be, per raw, can a warrior use their deed die on other feats of strength like skill checks and non-attack actions? Her rules is written, no, they cannot. It has to be some sort of attack. But I do allow those mighty deeds with skill checks in my game. 
Stefan, what's your final answer? Uh, it has to be suitably cinematic because if we are emulating, you know, that appendix end fiction, it's not just a weightlifting, you know, competition. It has to be, you know, if if we're doing it based off of a strength check, for as an example, it has to be a weightlifting competition with a cinematic style flourish. So, you would know, a answer cool, yes. Would a suitable cinematic moment be someone falling after they failed nine luck checks and they throw a barrel to get them to the side? I think so. I mean, if they failed nine luck checks and they're still alive, I think you may have done something wrong. Um, <laughs> Jake is still pissed at me about that adventure. Jake, what is your final answer on this question? Uh, rules is written. No, cannot add to it because, as you said, it does reference attack rules prior to any attack. But in my games, I do allow it. All right. And Darren, what is your final answer? I'm sticking with no. All right. So there you have it, folks. That brings us to question four. During play, should judges relegate? The degree of success from a Mighty Deeds of Arms. And so, when I do Mighty Deeds of Arms in my games, they tell me what their Mighty Deed of Arm is, and if they're successful with a three or higher, it happens. You have so much else going on as a judge that you're trying to keep track of. Rooms, monsters, where everybody is, what they're doing. Do you guys relegate in your game, regulate in your game, different degrees of success darren um i generally i generally don't and this sort of goes into one of my one of my pet peeves about this part of the rules i really dislike the the types of deeds section and the, like the specific examples because i feel that it limits the creativity of the player and that's the only thing where I see a very codified degree of success. Uh, the thing that I usually stick with is on, on page 88. It says the deed must be within the reasonable ability of a warrior to perform given the character's level and the enemy's size and power. That's all the guidance that I need. If, a, if it's a level one warrior trying to do something, it's going to be a certain amount of power based on his level as they get higher that's when they'll do that jake what are your thoughts and elaine if we could bring up handout uh let's see which one is it handout 5a please i made a handy dandy flow chart uh for the deeds that we're talking about so if we look at this handout 5a uh this is from the rule book and it's got the different degrees of success guys i sent that to you in a private message three for seven and it goes right across there, and it kind of shows the different degrees of success. Uh, Jake, what are your thoughts on the whole topic? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, I don't think a judge should do that stuff. You know, like you said, the judge has so much to worry about with the monsters, the rooms, what's going on in the combat. You know, it's probably just gonna fall through the cracks. And, um, but also on the same side of that, I haven't really run enough high level dcc games where i really see that i'm running one two three level games where the d die is a d3 d4 d5 i am not seeing well, d dies of five or d rolls of six or seven or higher that, that's actually perfect though because if a warrior succeeds on those lower level rolls like to a, to a three i say i want to slash the foe across the forehead and blind them do you allow them to be blinded on a three yeah Yes, I do. So if we look at rules as written, that would only be a negative two to hit. Stefan, what are your thoughts on the whole situation? Um, I never reference these things and, and go by the examples given in the book. So yeah, the, as Darren said, the judge has a lot to do already. And you're trying to keep like the pacing of combat really good. So I just stopping to look up the book is gonna mess up your game. So uh I just adjudicate as seems fit. If the level one fighter tells me if he makes his deed, he wants to decapitate Maman, Archduke of Hell, I'm going to say, no, you're not going to do that. But we'll, let's see, and, and we'll figure out something in between no and 
one hit KOing of an arch devil. Well, Elena, let's bring up handout 4A, please. Page 43 says the mechanic for the Mighty Deeds of Arms was designed to encourage exciting stunts by ambitious warriors in the tradition of literary heroes. The goal is to create a rules system that encourages situation specific freedom without creating a lot of cumbersome rules. So he, he's not trying to overburden you with rules there. The author's original expectation was that this system would be used for disarms, parries, and other traditional combat maneuvers. But in actual play testing, the Mighty Deeds of Arms have been exciting and unpredictable. It's clear now that the system encourages creative action, and the author believes it works best with creative warriors who devise interesting attacks. I think the original intent was the Mighty Deeds of Arms as we know it, that other handout. But I think it's become its own thing with warriors doing magnificent things that nobody has ever thought of. If we bring up handout 4B, though, page 88, the deed must be within the reasonable ability of a warrior to perform, given the character's level and the enemy's size and power. I think, Darren, you referenced that. Use the examples below and the judge's discretion to adjudicate. For example, a low-level warrior could not throw an archdemon even with a great deed roll, but a great deed roll might let him throw a large orc that no normal man could budge. And Stefan, I think you brought that up as well. So I, I think it's grown into something beyond the tables that are given. And I think those are just for reference. What do you, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, I agree gonna... that they're that they're there for reference, but I I also run into a lot of games where players will say like, okay, what what's my deed? I'm going to look through this thing and pick one of these, and I think that's that's fine if you have no idea what to do. But I would rather just completely take them out and say, what do you want to do, Jake? Yeah, well, it, within the book, uh, I remember when I first was looking at them. I liked them as a template, you know, for someone new to DCC, someone new to the warrior. It's a good base, you know, some good basic maneuvers that you can do. So once you're comfortable with the warrior, once you understand how the deed works, then you start really getting creative, figuring things out. Um, but yeah, the degrees of success could go out completely and I'd be just fine with it. I think it's more, just more add adding options to it because, you know, there's a lot, I'm sure that, uh, went through Joseph Goodman's head as he was designing an RPG and just wanted to make sure he had as much to find, I'm sure, as he could, I trying to find that my, balance. I think one of my favorite deeds, and Stefan, it might have been a game that you were running. Beastmen coming up, and we were trapped in the alleyway, and the town was on fire, and I used my deed to hit a supporting um, post on the house next to us, to try to get it to fall and block the alley so the beastmen couldn't get to us. And uh, that kind of brings me back to our last question. If you say you're attacking the chandelier to swing across the chasm, that's an attack. All you got to do is say, I attack that chandelier to use your deed dice. A little trick there. <laughs> I don't think you, you need to attack the chandelier. The yeah, you can attack and then like say, and I'm swinging about with the chandelier yeah. in addition to my attack and that's i'm i'm getting better use out of my movement action through that well, I'm attacking method. these guys by swinging across the gorge on this thing that's right all you got to do is say i attack well <laughs> if we bring up handout 4c page 88 specifies the deed succeeds at the most basic level if an attack hits and the d die is a three or higher so it gives us directions that it succeeds at the most basic level. The attack inflicts normal damage, the deed takes place. The higher the deed, the greater the deed. The judge may still allow an enemy savings throw and require an opposed check of some kind. So at these basic levels of three and four, the enemies are kind of intended to be able to avoid those damages with a savings throw or an opposed check. It's not written in stone because these are not mighty 5th, 6th, 7th level warriors yet. Um, handout 4D goes on to say, on page 88, there's no limit to the types of D that a warrior can perform. Any situation appropriate specialized attacks should be encouraged. 
to help provide some general framework for understanding the concept behind Mighty Deeds of Arm, we've provided seven general categories below. These are merely suggestions to give a sense of possibility and scale. The guidelines that follow should help the judge decide which benefits to apply to a higher deed role. Um, so we are getting close to time. Stefan, I'm going to ask your final answer on this. During play, should judges regulate the degree of success from a Mighty Deeds of Arm? Yes, for the arch devil reason I gave out. Um, level one warrior, no deal. Uh, level ten warrior, yeah, I'm sure. If if the deed's high enough, I I agree. I I'm gonna work on this more actually because usually whatever the warrior dwarfs say their deed is, if they're successful, I say yeah, that absolutely works. But I'm gonna try to be a meaner judge and regulate the degrees of success on these. So uh, my final answer is during play, should judges regulate the degree of success from Mighty Deeds of Arms? Yes, you should. Based on rules as written, uh, you should be, threes should not be as successful as sevens. Jake, what's your final answer? Uh, my final answer is uh, still gonna be no, because I want the plea Excuse me. I want the players to come up with something creative. I want the players to do something wild and fantastic. And generally, I'm always going to forget about it, even if I make a note before the game, even if I tell myself I'm going to regulate the degrees of their success, I'm always going to forget it as a judge. All right. And Darren, what is your final answer on that? I say yes. And to uh, piggyback off of what Jake said, I think you can still allow them to be creative but also regulate the degrees of success if they say they want to do something and get a certain success you can just you describe how it's happening ultimately you're the judge and what you say is what happens uh, it can be a slightly lesser version of that if uh, they get a low roll but i have never seen a player get upset by that they said oh cool my deed worked and that's I'm it. go ahead i'm sorry um, I'll, i'm all set go ahead Elaine, if we could bring up handout 5A one more time. So if we look at the chart I sent you guys, under blinding, a 3, only a negative 2 to hit. You got to get down to like a 5, and then they're blind for 1d4 rounds, and it's still a negative 8 to hit. Disarming, uh, they're disarmed, and their, their uh, weapon could fall far enough away that they wouldn't be able to grab it, or a negative 1 to hit. These, these aren't really super things. Pushed back a three, they're only pushed back a couple feet. I I've let people shove things off of cliffs before on a three. Uh, tips and throws, they are allowed a reflex save or they're knocked prone. A precision shot, uh, strike a small tiny target, uh, possibly an extra 1d4 damage based on judge's adjudication. And rallying that whole category, I would strike because I've never had anybody have a higher link payment. And then for the defensive category, I've had this come up before. Uh, warriors want to try to attack defensively. It, a three is only a plus one to AC bonus. Uh, at a seven, it's plus three to them and four of their allies. And, but they can't move. I think they can move half their movement at that point. They have to maintain the shield wall. Uh, so I definitely am guilty of allowing deeds at, at threes or higher. Uh, you know, minimum results, the deed goes off. Uh, but I'm going to try to be a little tougher on it. Uh, any final thoughts on these questions from you guys? They were good questions. I mean, a lot of them I was able to immediately think of an answer, but then had to sort of look closer and said, you know what? There's a wiggle room here. And as we often find, there's a lot of wiggle room. Uh, Jake, what are your final thoughts on these questions? Yeah, it was interesting to kind of really get into the book again and kind of look at these specific situations because the whole thing that I loved about DCC when I first discovered it was it was rulings, not rules. It's You've got all these things here, but it's still wide and open to judge interpretation to kind of fill in the blanks where they see it, where they see fit. And Stefan? 
Don't regulate those mighty deeds too hard. Wizards are messing things up already. Way more than fighters ever do, or warriors <laughs> ever do. Well, we're going to take us out, kind of going off of what Jake said, on some words of wisdom from the Dark Master himself. Elaine, if you could bring up handout 5B for us. JG says, he's talking to somebody who's discussing the mighty deeds. He says, don't overthink the mighty deeds. They should require no work from the judge. It's up to the player to define them. Every time a warrior lands a strike, he should be describing his attack and what he attempts with the mighty deed. For some players, this is really hard, which is kind of the point of having the table. They're not imaginative in how they think of attacks, and they're stuck in 3E feats as a way to run their fighter or something else. Some players never get it, and they continually forget their mighty deed. But for most players, they gradually get it, and they start to love the mighty deed. On every single attack, they define a special move. Usually they figure out how to attempt different moves at different times. This one's a trip, this one's a disarm. Eventually, they might settle into a rhythm with a couple of preferred moves. At low levels, there's a couple possible results from a deed. So you really only have one or two possible results from every deed. But by the time the character starts to approach third or fourth level, you have a sense of what the fighter tends to attempt, and you can start determining how that ability might scale. So the more you play with someone, you can scale their abilities that they try with the mighty deed. But remember, he says, it's the player's job to describe what he tries to do. All you have to do is think it through and say, okay, he needs to be third level to try this version of it or fourth level to try this version of it. Since the deed results roughly correlate with level based of the based on the deed die. And he ends up saying you will have many sessions of gameplay between each level up, so there's plenty of time to think and scale. So I'm going to try to scale on my next games. Uh, I don't know if I'll be successful because it, it does take kind of rewiring your brain. Thank you guys, Jake, Darren, for being on. You've been great guests. Darren, do you have anything to say in closing as we go out? You got anything going on? Any games coming up? Um. Yeah, I mean, I run pretty regular games uh, each week. I've got some... MCC coming up soon, some DCC horror coming up soon, the Dungeon Crawler server, and um, happily, I've got an adventure that's being published in Stefan's uh, Mysteries of the Multiverse. So that's yeah. exciting. Backer, I just made the uh, the Mixum, you know, print run order for that a couple days ago now, so uh, I'll get it in a couple weeks, and then Backer should probably get it a couple weeks after that. Mysteries Excellent. of the Multiverse coming to a store near you soon. Darren, what's the name of that adventure? It's called And Now Our Feature Presentation. Nice. Taking me back to the drive-in. Exactly. Exactly Jake, where you go. Jake, do you have any uh, closing words for us? You got anything coming up? Yeah, so I've got kind of try to keep myself busy running some games. I'm on like 11 or 12 of road, of my road crew games, so I'm just trying to trying to get that belt buckle that I will never wear. But next week, I'm going to be running the level five adventure Beyond the Black Gate by Harley Stroh. And uh, Grape, I think you're actually a player in that. So uh, you'll have to I, keep me keep me honest with trying to regulate the deed I, dice there. I, I saw a level five adventure and I jumped on it. So I think I am in that one. I might just oh. have to play a warrior now so I can get those big deeds. And then in August, I've got DCC Horror Game coming up, The Corpse That Love Built. And. Um, sea Queen's one Escape, of my, right? Yeah, the Sea Queen Escapes, level 3 adventure. So, I I'll get some more, more practice regulating deeds there, because it's higher than level 1. Alright, so everybody, those games can be found on the Dungeon Crawler server, if you're interested. Uh, there might still be a couple seats left. Stefan, what do you got going on? Uh, Kickstarter fulfillment, and writing away on the next projects, which uh, is too many disparate things. <laughs> I got too many half-written things. I don't know which the next one that people will see is, but I'll keep writing. Outstanding. And I've been working on, I'm trying to get this out before ZenQuest, a Zen of reverse spells. So I'm going through the rule book, and I'm making a reverse spell for just about every spell. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a reverse one for Patron Bond yet, but <laughs> I might just. But all the other ones, I've figured out a reverse spell. So I'm going to try and get that ready. And uh, get it ready for long con. Maybe have a couple little preview 
bootleg copies down a long time. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight, gentlemen. As always, it was a great episode. Join us in two weeks where our guests, we're, we haven't confirmed it yet, but we're going to try to have the Purple Sorcerer, John Marr, on, and the Purple Apprentice, John Marr. Uh, we're going to try to have them both on for the next episode. So we'll see you in two weeks, um, which is going to be August 2nd at 8 o'clock. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Good night.